Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Dr. Jim Oliver. I'm the provost here at the Seminole campus of St. Petersburg College. Uh, and I want to thank you for coming uh, to the Village Square uh, this evening. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the campus, uh, those of you who are new, and welcome you back, Village Square members who have been with us in the past. Uh, I'd like you to, I know you're in the middle of dinner, uh, but in the, in, in the uh, uh, interest of time, I'm going to ask you, please, if you would stand uh, and join me in uh, say, stating the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag. very much. It's great to see so many of our Village Square members and a good number of guests here for the Village Square this evening. Uh, as usual, it's uh, terrific to see uh, so many students in the audience. Uh, we have students from the Seminole Campus Student Government Association, uh, students majoring in public policy and administration, students from our Health uh, Education Center, and students uh, from our Seminole Campus Ethics classes. Would all the students please stand and be recognized? Students in, among us. We also want to acknowledge our media co-sponsors, the Tampa Bay Times and WEDU Television. Let's give them a round of applause as well. We're very excited about uh, this evening's program. As you can tell from uh, David's opening uh, comments, uh, it's going to be a departure from our usual Village Square format. Uh, while it's fine to have great speakers uh, like we did in January when Clyde Butcher uh, addressed the group uh, once in a while, you've told us you want more engagement between speakers and the audience. Tonight, we promised to provide that. Uh, and that's why David announced the survey uh, as you were getting your food. I hope you've had some interesting conversation already during the dinner. Um, and that you'll have uh, that opportunity a few more times over the course of the evening. The Village Square is about conversation, exchanging different views and learning from one another. Today we've asked our students to serve as conversation facilitators in this exercise in civic engagement. Students, this is your chance to hone your leadership skills. Uh, you've had about 20 minutes or so to vote on the first question. Um, so let's declare the voting uh, over and look at the poll result, results. Now let me emphasize that this is not a scientific survey uh, since this is not a randomly selected audience. Um, think of it, pardon me, Kevin? think of it as a straw poll, uh, which the dictionary.com defines as an unofficial vote taken to obtain an indication of the general trend of an opinion of an audience on a particular issue. So that's what this is about. Uh, we had about, uh, I, I think Shantae mentioned there was 91 folks voted, so not everyone voted. I, and again, uh, there'll be votes uh, uh, later, two additional votes this evening. Um, if you don't have a smartphone, we do have computers in the back. Please exercise your right to vote in this straw poll. But I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really surprised at the outcome of uh, these votes. And uh, uh, if, if this is a snapshot of this audience, uh, we have a lot of people who are here tonight to form an opinion about this issue. Those in favor uh, with 39 percent, opposed at 17 percent, and the majority, at least the majority of, of, the, uh, of the overall, not the majority of the total, but the largest number of votes went to undecided. So we'll be back to our cell phones after we've heard from our speakers uh, to see uh, if the outcome changes after what you've heard from our speakers. So let's begin the process by having David Clement introduce our moderator and welcome again. Thank you, Dr. Oliver. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for this evening, Craig Kopp. I, uh, he is someone I consider a friend, even though I just met him a couple of weeks ago. That's because I listen to NPR radio on my way home every evening, as I'm sure many of you do. Craig is the voice that we have come to know on all things considered over the past three years. 
He is a host of that program five days a week, and he is an award-winning radio journalist since 1974. His full bio is in your program, so uh, you can read that, and I won't waste time uh, any more on that. And without further ado, welcome, please, Craig Cobb. Uh, good, good. It's not one when I had hair. I did, uh, now I have hair on my face, and I'm not sure exactly what to do with it, but I don't have any pictures because I, deci I decided to do this somewhere around Thanksgiving last year. Um, the only time I ever watched morning television is during the Thanksgiving Day parades, and I noticed everybody on the Today Show was growing a beard, and I thought, I'm going to try that too. And so here I am. Uh, thanks to David, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, with such an important and uh, interesting topic to discuss. Uh, and that's what we'll be doing here tonight. And I'll probably repeat myself a couple of times as we go through this. I was telling some of the uh, panelists that uh, I spent uh, 10 years in my broadcast career as a talk radio host, and uh, I don't want to go back there again. Um, uh, the idea of having a civil discourse this evening is very appealing to me and something that's much needed on uh, any topic, including this one. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I spent most of my life in the state of Ohio, uh, northern Ohio to begin with, and uh, southern Ohio uh, before I came to Florida three years ago. Uh, I began my career in radio news in 1974 which I have pointed out to several people today, also happens to be the year that High Times Magazine published its first issue. Uh, so suffice it to say, I have been covering the marijuana issue my entire career. I lived the majority of my life in a state that decriminalized marijuana, recriminalized marijuana, is considering decriminalizing marijuana again. The only thing that hasn't changed over all of those years is the fact that marijuana has never left the radar, and that's why we're here tonight to talk about its latest resurfacing in the culture. So let's get to it. The issue on the table tonight is should Florida go to pot? This is not the official title. In case you hadn't guessed already, it's kind of David's way of just phrasing the proposed constitutional amendment that will be on the general election ballot in November, on November the 4th. Uh, the ballot language is supposed to come up on the screen here in a minute. There it is. You can uh, see how it will read on the ballot, and that's it. This is what uh, the Supreme Court approved. Basically, it would allow the medical use of marijuana for individuals with debilitating diseases as determined by a licensed Florida physician. The rest of the wording deals with how the health department set up a system for registering patients, dispensing the marijuana medicine. Uh, the final sentence does not authorize any non-medical use, possession, or production of marijuana. That would be recreational use. It is forbidden in the language of this ballot referendum on medical marijuana. We have a lot to cover tonight. I'll give you as much time as possible to get your questions in. So let's uh, meet our first presenter to make the case for passage of the, men the amendment. Here to take that affirmative side, Ben Polera. He is the campaign manager for United for Care, which, is, which sponsored the constitutional amendment to legalize medical marijuana in Florida and is running the campaign to promote passage of the, uh, the amendment. Ben? Make your case in seven minutes or less. You're first. Well, thank, thank you, Craig, and uh, thank you to St. Pete College for having me here. Um, I also want to say a special thank you to Kathy Jordan, who's in the audience tonight. Um, Kathy Jordan is... Kathy Jordan is one of the reasons that we're having this conversation and fighting this fight. Uh, Kathy has ALS and has been using marijuana for decades. She would not be with us tonight if not for marijuana. And so she is living proof of why medical marijuana should be legalized in the state of Florida. 
Um, and I'm, I'm running the campaign uh, for United for Care to pass Amendment 2 in the November 2014 ballot in the general election. Uh, we need 60% of the vote to pass, and I hope you all will say yes on Amendment 2 when it comes time to vote this fall. Um, but again, we are doing this for Kathy and for hundreds of thousands of Floridians who are out there every day suffering. Uh, some people, like Kathy, are currently using medical marijuana illegally, uh, and others uh, would like to, but are not because it's illegal. Um, these are people who have tried everything, who are on huge cocktails of prescription drugs, and either the drugs don't work or the drugs work, but the side effects are just so horrendous um, that it's ultimately not worth it. And, you know, our basic position on this is that in the course of the doctor-patient relationship, if, if a doctor prescribes a particular course of treatment to their patients, whether that be um, yoga or uh, multivitamin or dietary change or marijuana, that the patient should be able to pursue that doctor's recommendations without having to live like a criminal. Uh, and I think that's pretty simple, and I think most Floridians think that's pretty simple. We had, we had this poll up on the, uh, on the big board here this evening, uh, which was emphasized it was not scientific. The scientific polls that have been conducted on the issue show out that this is not a controversial issue for Floridians. Um, recent polls show 70, 74, 75, and up to 78 percent of Floridians support medical marijuana uh, for that simple reason, that you should be able to follow your doctor's recommendations without having to fear arrest. Um, but again, this issue is not, this is not free from controversy and emotion, which is why we're here tonight. And, and I'm happy to be here tonight and debate the issue with, uh, with your good sheriff of Pinellas County here, uh, Bob Galtieri. I, I, Bob, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, sheriff Galtieri is a fine example of public service. He's been working in this community for 30 years. And uh, I think he's going to express some concerns about Amendment 2 from a public safety perspective, and I respect that. Uh, I believe a lot of those concerns are unfounded or supported by biased data. Um, but I respect his position and the job that he has to do every day, and I'm going to do my best this evening to respectfully address those concerns. Um, I cannot say the same for the second panelist this evening, um, Mr. Carlton Turner. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Carlton Turner is simply not a credible mes messenger on this topic, um, both because of his resume and, and despite it. Um, Mr. Turner oversaw the execution of one of the most ineffective and counterproductive public policy campaigns in the United States history, uh, Just Say No. Um, just say no. How, how well did that work? Well, um, crack cocaine during his tenure devastated the American, uh, the American urban environment and basically destroyed an entire generation of African Americans in this country. Um, and beyond that, opponents of medical marijuana and, and marijuana like to cry, well, what about the children? And that's really where this was directed. Um, I don't have kids, but uh, for anybody who does, I think people know that the best way to get a kid or a teenager uh, to do something is to tell them not to do it. Um, and it's like people who think that the best way to prevent teen pregnancy is by telling kids don't have sex. Uh, it just doesn't work, folks. Um, which, which leads me to the real reason not to, not to buy a word of what comes out of Mr. Turner's mouth. Um, this man once claimed that marijuana causes homosexuality and ultimately AIDS. Um, I am not sure at this point whether that statement is more ignorant or more offensive. Uh, I mean, it's clearly both, um, but, uh, but I think that's one of many reasons not to, uh, not to listen to Mr. Turner as a credible messenger on this issue. Uh, I look forward to a respectful, substantive conversation with Sheriff Galtieri, and I would encourage you to, uh, while listening to Mr. Turner, you can respond to emails or text messages that you have pending. Um, and just really try to ignore what he has to say on the issue. Thank you for having me here. I hope you guys will vote yes on Amendment 2 this fall. Thanks, Ben. And now uh, for the fire back. Uh, let's hear from the opposing point of view. It is my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Carlton E. Turner, who served on the cabinet under President Reagan as drug czar and as leader of the Just Say No campaign against illegal drugs. Uh, Dr. Turner, it's your turn to make your case in seven minutes or less. Thank you for the organizers and the president of the college and you, Craig, and David. Uh, John Don had a wonderful statement. He said a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. You just heard one of those dangerous things. I never said that, and the reason he's using that is we were so effective in dealing with normal and the policy groups 
But they made the comment that once you leave the White House, we will ensure that you are never an effective spokesman again for this issue. Well, if you saw the movie Independence Day and the pilot says, boys, I'm back, I'm back. So we had a conversation about civility. This was going to be a civil type discourse. But what happens with the pro-drug people is maybe they're smoking their own stuff and they forget an agreement they make because of short-term memory loss or working memory. Now let's talk about some of the facts. You talk about marijuana. Marijuana is a crude drug. It's over 700 components. Over 100 of those are cannabinoids. And each cannabinoid has a biological profile. That biological profile may be positive, it may be negative, depending on the indication. And it's talking about the work. I've published over 100 peer-reviewed papers on this subject. I've been in the field since 1970. I was a legal marijuana producer for the federal government. I distributed it through the United Nations, and I saw all the bad things. Now, let's talk about the issues here. There's a ballot before you as citizens. And if you look at that ballot, that ballot does not put anything on conditions. It says anything that is recommended. A doctor cannot prescribe marijuana as medicine because it's not a medicine. If marijuana were a medicine, don't you think some medical organizations throughout the world, particularly the WHO, would accept that and uh, support it? No, but there are components in that plant that do have medical benefits. Now you say, well, we can't trust the FDA. The FDA is hiding this from us and they want us to smoke it. Well, when you smoke it, if you smoke marijuana, you're going to get more cancer-causing compounds than you get out of a tobacco cigarette. That's a fact of life. It's been proven. Read the literature. If you don't believe it, read the literature. This is America. You have every right to say what you think. I have every right to say what I think. If you want to see the documentations, there are bibliographies out there. Now let's talk about something else. There's no age limit on this thing. Kids can get it. Kids can get it. And there is no requirement for anything else but to say they need it. I can stump my toe and I can go in and a person can give me a recommendation for marijuana. Now let's talk about marijuana a different thing. We were going to talk about the issues, but we got off with personal attacks, so I'm going to go a little bit room. If I ask you if there were a medication in this country that caused 45,000 young people between the ages of 15 and 17 to go in an emergency room every year and it's growing at 13% a year, what would you say? Yeah, yeah, keep it, get it off the market. Oh, but you know what? It's 45,000 plus going into the emergency room for marijuana. Between the ages of 15 and 17, check your data with NIDA. Check it, folks. You don't want to hear it, but you're going to hear it. You can laugh all you want. Check your data. Let me tell you something else. We talk about FDA and medication, and it's a pharmaceutical. Well, let me tell you something. People say the people in the pharmaceutical industry and researchers like me are bad guys. By definition, I'm evil. By definition, the FDA is evil. Well, I want every lady here tonight that's taking birth control pills to go home and flush them down the commode because you can't trust the federal government. I want every guy here that's taking Viagra to go home and flush the Viagra down the drain because you can't trust the FDA. And the next time you take your child to a doctor and the doctor says your child needs penicillin, but you don't need to take penicillin. You go home and you eat moldy bread because that's where you get penicillin from. So there are facts in this thing that we don't want to talk about. Glaucoma. One of the persons running around the country at one time, he's deceased, and I was a friend of mine, Bob Randall. He says, I'm smoking glaucoma. And I said, Bob, are you willing to give up medication and only smoke marijuana for your glaucoma? Bob's answer was, I'm no fool. So I'd like to ask respectfully, Ms. Jordan, if she takes her regular prescribed medication, or is the only thing she takes is marijuana? Yeah, I'd ask her that, and I'd ask anyone else. I didn't hear her answer. Set some ground rules here. We're not having a debate tonight. We're having a, you will have your opportunity to say something. I know that passions are high here. We've already started out on a bit of a high note. And I will respectfully ask everyone, I, I said this before, I spent 10 years in talk radio, hell, yelling at each other. And we're not here to yell tonight at each other. We're here to discuss. One person gets an opportunity to speak, 
another person gets an opportunity to speak. You would not do that? Well, maybe you would with your neighbors over the back fence. But I would hope in this neighborhood we would have a little more respect for each other. And with that, we have the guidelines set again. Please continue. Thank you. I would like the time given back to me that was taken away for this, if you don't mind. Fine, you got a minute back. Okay, thank you. Now let's look at some of the issues, what we're dealing with. This is not marijuana's medicine. This is a con job that was designed by some pro-marijuana people that could not get it legal, and they decided we are going to go the medical route, and we got a tape of that. So the job was, let's get medical marijuana out there and get the public to believe in it. And if you believe everything in the literature, there's not a thing in the world that marijuana won't cure. Not a thing. So if you believe the FDA should be done away with, what you ought to be voting on is not an amendment to the Florida Constitution, but getting Congress to do away with the FDA and make marijuana your drug of choice for everything known to man. That's what you ought to do. And men, let me tell you something about marijuana. Your sperm count goes down. Nobody wants to listen to that, but it does. Definitely provable fact. Peer-reviewed literature. There are more data known about marijuana today than ever. And it is consistent throughout time. Article yesterday of a person, casual user, with some deep brain damage. Everybody said this is new. It's not new. Not new at all. It was known in the 70s. But we didn't experiment with humans in the 70s. We used animals. And it was proven in monkeys then. And you say, well, I'm not a monkey. But it's in your brain now, and you don't want to buy that. And let me tell you what else is coming your way. If you think the pill mills were bad, wait till you see the pot docs. Because this amendment does not hold anyone responsible. The doctor that recommends it, he can't prescribe it, is not responsible. The user's not responsible. The grower or producer's not responsible. So who's responsible? If you're a businessman and you have a person involved with medical marijuana and they get in an accident, who's responsible? And if you think the docs, if you can't take their license away from them, you think they're not going to be out there recommending it? If you look at one state where 90% of the people using this product in medical marijuana is there because of miscellaneous pain, not because of glaucoma, not because of AIDS, not because of anything else. But there are good products out there on the market from the therapeutics. They're being developed, and let me tell you this, medical marijuana is like marijuana. It's not a bit different from the, medical, from the marijuana you buy. But the cannabinoids, individual cannabinoids, have therapeutic potential. And as a pharmacognosist, I've worked all my life to get those on the market, three of them on the market right now. That's the way to go because people spend millions of dollars protecting you. And it's what the Food and Drug Administration is all about, protecting the American public from snake oil salesmen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Turner. And uh, finally, our uh, next speaker, as we all know, law enforcement has a stake in this debate and has had a stake in it for a long time. Here to present a view from that perspective is Bob Gualtieri. He's the sheriff of Pinellas County. Sheriff Gualtieri, in seven minutes or less, you and your fellow peace officers' thoughts on legalizing medical marijuana. Sure. Thank you and good evening. Where I want to begin is to be clear that I, like I'm sure most of you, am a compassionate person. I don't want to see anybody suffering. Um, I want to see people get the medication that they need so that they don't suffer, so they're not in pain. But one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that, and most importantly, is that what is in marijuana that eliminates this pain and relieves this pain that this woman has and other is THC. That's what it is. And the THC is the compound in marijuana. There are today available pills, Marinol and a variety of other brand name pills that contain that THC that do what smoking marijuana does. So that's something that can't be lost in this discussion and can't be lost in this debate because in order to get the benefits of opiate derivatives like Oxycontin, Oxycodone and the others, you don't see people running around wanting to smoke opium. Okay? It doesn't, it's not necessary. So there is an alternative. Uh, some uh, general facts that I think that are important to this discussion is what's happened elsewhere. In California, they enacted medical marijuana uh, in 1996. Three percent of that state's population are using medical marijuana today. Sixty-seven percent 
of those people report using medical marijuana for muscle spasms, headaches, anxiety, depression. In Oregon, 1998, they passed it. And as of July 2013, there's 54,000 people in that state. And they're using it for severe pain, quote unquote, which includes headaches, menstrual cramps, and arthritis. This isn't about people with cancer and AIDS and these other conditions that are predominantly using this medical marijuana. And Ben mentioned that it's an easy issue or inferred that it was an easy issue. It's not. It's a complex issue and the devil's in the details. And I just want to walk you through briefly um, the statute itself, okay, the referendum itself. And while they put it up here on the screen, there's a lot more to it because there's a lot of definitions. Is that in my problem from a law enforcement perspective is what is in there and what is not in there. First is that you can, under this referendum, and if this passes, be able to get a medical marijuana certificate for a debilitating condition. And it lists all the serious things that you would think in there, but then it also says, or other conditions for which a physician believes the medical use of marijuana would likely outweigh the potential risks of health for the patient. That means aches and pains. That means I got a sore neck. That means I got a sore foot. That means I got a headache. It's whatever some physician decides that the use of marijuana outweighs whatever the effect of that condition is. So it's not limited to serious conditions. A qualifying patient is somebody with that debilitating condition, and it could even be a kid, is that you can have a caregiver, which is somebody 21 or over, and it doesn't even tell us what a caregiver is. It could be a convicted felon, it could be a drug dealer, it could be anybody over 21 with no qualifications, no medical qualifications, nothing, who gives us, quote, medical marijuana to a 16-year-old then there's nothing that requires parental notification or parental consent to the 16-year-old. Really? Physicians can't write prescriptions for this. This isn't medicine. It would be illegal. They'd lose their DEA license. It would violate federal law for them to write a prescription. So they issued these certifications. And based upon these certifications, people can get marijuana, and there's no such thing as medical marijuana. These dispensaries, these medical marijuana treatment centers would open, and they would be, with that certification, selling this marijuana. We're going to go right back to the problem that we just dealt with, which is the pill mill problem. You're going to have these physicians, and all it says is physician. It doesn't say MD, it doesn't say DO, chiropractors, podiatrists, anybody who wants to hang a shingle out and make money off of writing these certifications, which is the exact same problem we had with the pill mills, because you have unscrupulous practitioners out there who are just trying to make a buck. And we're going to see these places pop up all over the place. People go in, oh, doc, I need a, I need a certification because my, head, my neck hurts, my head hurts, and you get your unlimited supply. You don't go back for uh, getting it refilled. You get your certification, and it's unlimited quantities as much as you want for as long as you want. Also, under this ballot amendment and referendum, there's immunity. So doctors, sellers, users, growers, transporters, and assisters are immune from any criminal and civil liability. So how in the world, when you have immunity from criminal liability, are we going to be able to police these pill mills, if you will, and these really, they're really coming down to pot docs that you're going to end up with that for 200 bucks will give you any certification in the world? So think about this. In Oregon, nine doctors, nine in the whole state of Oregon, approved 28,000 users. If you apply that here, and we had something like that, those nine doctors and $200 for an exam, and that's about what they're going to charge because we know that from experience, those nine doctors would have made $5.6 million writing these certifications. This is about money. It's about making money. It's about a segue to recreational use. If this was really, really about pain, about people suffering, is Marinol is available, all the other THC uh, uh, drugs that are out there by prescription. And what they'll tell you on the other side is, well, it doesn't work as well. It takes longer to take effect. Well, it does take a little bit longer to take effect, but it also lasts longer in your system. And they're working on now other uh, aspects of Marinol uh, that where you can use it as a spray. 
and there's other forms of it that are being worked on. We have an alternative out there today. You can get a prescription for it. It is legal. It contains the THC. It does what's necessary. It accomplishes it without people having to sit around on a Saturday night and sit around a table and smoke marijuana. So to summarize it, here are the problems. Kids, unscrupulous practitioners, we're going to have a proliferation of these pot docks and these pot shops, and it is going to take us back to the, what we just got done dealing with for the last five years, and significant illegal activity, because it's under a guise of helping people when all it really is is a segue to recreational use of marijuana. And from a law enforcement perspective, this is a big problem. The devil is in the details, and it's something we should oppose. Thank you. Go ahead. Well, we have had food for our bellies. Now we had food for our thoughts. Um, thanks, Sheriff. Let's, for a minute, go back to our phones. And I know. You just don't say that from a dais very often, but um, let's go back to our phones and see if any minds have changed. We're going to repeat the same question. What is your view on legalizing me medical marijuana in the state of Florida? You know, why POT, NPOT, I think you got that, yes or no, you, undecided. Uh, and uh, the number again is the same, 22333. Um, if you don't have a cell phone, if you don't have texting capability, we do have some laptops set out here back right, um, and you can place your vote there. Please just vote once. Um, I'm going to give you five minutes to do this, and also um, this is your opportunity at your table uh, to talk over what you just heard from the three speakers that we've just had surrounding this issue of medical marijuana in the state of Florida. Think about what they had to say. Think about what your reaction was to it. I know there's some groups of tables here where I think everybody's on the same ship. Um, if you're not at one of those tables, but have a five-minute discussion while we collect this vote, and we'll be back with you in just a minute. All right, I think we've had enough time to get your votes in. And if I could have your attention once again. Good to hear that many people talking. I hope it was on topic. <laughs> Let's see what the numbers show at this point. Well, according to the straw poll, and I will point to you that this is an unscientific poll. This is for discussion and uh, furthering discussion, but 74% now in favor that was 39%. 17 opposed was 18 opposed. That was pretty much the same as the first poll. 45% uh, undecided in the first poll down to 9%. We take that for what it's worth to spur on our discussion. And before we start taking some other questions, if anybody at any table have something that came up that uh, was revealing to any of you? Did, was there a particular point of view that you hadn't heard before? Had somebody changed their mind since they walked in the doors here? Uh, any table. Back here in the back. Could somebody, is there a microphone available? Yeah. yeah you can I, ask this to the panel or just tell us what you talked about. Well, it was just a general comment. When we talk about, you know, the people wanting to get the medical marijuana and it being something that's going to be rampant on the streets, you know, we never talk about um, nursing homes, you know, and the people in nursing homes and how it would help them as well, you know. And, I think that demographic gets left behind because you're not thinking about them. You're not thinking about their conditions and the pain that they're going through as well. And I, I would also ask the panel, while, while, while I've got you here, um, start with the sheriff. What do you think the amount of marijuana use is in Florida now? Are there statistics that show, because we, we hear that um, this could lead to rampant marijuana use. Is there not man somewhat man rampant marijuana use now? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I'm sure there is. Okay, I, I'm sure. I'm sure it's being used just like you know other drugs are being used. Cocaine's being used, heroin's being used, etc. 
you know, just because they're being used doesn't make it right, number mm. one. And, and number two is, is the only statistics that I've seen uh, and, and know about um, are as far as the kids in Pinellas County, uh, the Department of Juvenile Justice, I believe, or it was uh, Department of Children and Families did a survey, and it was about 20, I believe 25 percent of all the kids said that they had tried a marijuana. These were kids 12 and over. Um, so it is out there as far as the kids are concerned. And you know, what message are we sending to the kids when we're saying don't smoke cigarettes, refrain from excessive use of alcohol, all these other kids, all these other things that kids are going to see. So just because the adults are doing it doesn't mean it's right and doesn't mean it's, it's good. And, and just because some people do it doesn't make it a good thing. The message that we're sending is that marijuana is medicine and marijuana helps people. And as, as the youngest guy on this stage, you know, it's not that long ago. I was in high school and I remember it was much more easy to get marijuana, uh, which is illegal, than, than to get alcohol or cigarettes, which were legal and, and controlled and regulated for adult use. So I think that the argument that a medical marijuana system that helps sick individuals like Kathy Jordan uh, would lead to increased teen use of marijuana or children's use of marijuana is, is this doesn't uh, simply make sense. Dr. Turner, you've been in this a long time. Well, wait a minute. I'm this, this, we, had, this. we changed titles tonight, all right? Just okay. Carlton. <laughs> Carlton, you've been in this a long time. Um, uh, you're still talking about it. Um, what figures do you have that shows that this will lead to rampant use of marijuana more than there is now? Well, I don't know the use of marijuana now. All I know is if you look at the incidents that we have in Colorado, that the kids uh, there have had a significant increase in suspensions from schools since they brought the medical marijuana in. They've also had an increase in the uh, problems of kids being kicked out of school. You've had an increase in the emergency room episodes, particularly one of the problems that you had with being accessible all that time. You're going is in now. that you're now medical marijuana uh, or marijuana. Marijuana we're talking about with kids is usually smoking. The trend now is to go to cookies. The trend is to go to Dabbing. If any of you have not, uh, if you looked at Dabbing, go to Dabbing, D-A-B-B-I-N-G. So if you look at the data from the schools, you see significant increase in problems in the schools. If you look at the data for the emergency room, you see significant increase in emergency room episodes in the states that have had medical marijuana over those that do not have it. If you look at driving with teenagers and others, you will find that there's been a 300% increase in drug driving in those states that have uh, what is referred to as marijuana as medicine, which is an oxymoron, but that's beside the point. Those are the data. I can give you exact specifics if you want them. I didn't bring them with me, but I can provide them. In this discussion, we hear a lot, you have many case histories of people who find great relief from pain and other symptoms of their disease from the use of medical marijuana. You, we keep tripping over whether or not those are the only people that will end up having access to marijuana under this referendum. How can the public be assured that that will be the case? Well, the first thing they should do is actually read the text of the amendment, as, as the sheriff said, the devil is in the details. And uh, under our amendment, there's a very strict process and a lot of hoops that you have to jump through in order to become a legal user of medical marijuana in the state of Florida. Uh, and it is, it is not, as, as the sheriff described, that it just simply anybody can get this for a headache. Uh, the Supreme Court, in their decision that put us on the ballot, affirmed that, uh, in fact, shockingly enough, the term debilitating does, in fact, mean debilitating. Um, so your physician must diagnose you with a debilitating disease or medical condition. I must certify that diagnosis in writing uh, and also must attach a timeline to that diagnosis and, and give you this physician certification. You have to send it to the State Department of Public Health and then receive an identification card. Uh, the other thing that is, that is in the amendment that, uh, that was not brought up is that there is no unlimited amount of marijuana under this law either. Uh, the State Department of Public Health has to use the best research available to come up with, with a, an amount of marijuana that a medical marijuana, a legal medical marijuana patient in the state of Florida can possess. Uh, and and you know, I don't think the bureaucrats of the State Mar Department of Public Health are going to say unlimited. Um, so I, I think those, those arguments are, are specious. Mr. It. Turner, is that possible? Anything is possible. But since you've done such a miserable job regulating tobacco and alcohol, how do you think you're going to regulate something where you can't hold the physician responsible? And if you read the documents, let me read you what it says. I happen to have a copy here. It says, 
medical condition, and it goes through the whole list, and at the end it says, are other conditions for which a physician believes that the medical use of marijuana would likely outweigh the potential health risk for a patient. Debilitating so that opens, conditions as the Supreme now, Court affirmed in their decision. Well, but that's not what it says. But that's what the Supreme that, Court said, well, and that's the law of the land. So well, uh, this know. hasn't passed yet, so it's not the law of the land. Well, what I'm <laughs> reading you here is what, what it says in this document. It says for any other condition. And then if you look at California, it's strange that California now, 240 municipalities and counties have done away with medical dispensaries in California. The governor's even said, go careful with this. You have to determine how many people you want stoned to have a productive society. So we need to, if you're going to do this, you need to look at all of the, I mean, Jerry Brown said that. If you'd like to see the quote, I'll give it to you. Jerry you Brown can snicker. Yeah, well, and we're but not, it's okay. We're not in the state of California. We're in the state of Florida. We wrote an amendment for the state of Florida. Uh, California was the first state to do this, and we would not be here without them, but they wrote a very loose law, which in, in many ways is not a medical marijuana law. Um, there have been 20 states since then that have passed medical marijuana laws, and we looked at all of those states and what to do and what not to do in drafting our amendment. Um, and so this will not look like California. This will look like the state of Florida. Chair, there is no question that for whatever condition, and I agree with Dr. Turner, it says there in black and white, okay, is that for any other condition the physician deems. But let's assume that it has a specific list and it's more constrained than that. It will end up in the hands of kids. It will end up in the hands of non-patients. It will end up in the hands of others. Just like Percocet does, just like Oxycontin does, just like Oxycodone does, just like all these other drugs do. And you're gonna have physicians out there uh, that are going to provide these certifications and you're going to have these uh, dispensaries that are going to dispense the stuff at very high THC levels, 25% THC, high levels. This isn't the 4% THC that you're buying from some guy that's growing ditch weed in the middle of Kansas. This is high quality, high content. It's going to be sought after. And because it's going to be sought after, because it's high quality THC, you're going to have abuse of it. It's going to end up in the wrong hands. And anybody that argues otherwise is being naive about it, I think. We have, I think, established some new lines in the debate. Um, and that is whether or not it is possible to legalize marijuana for medical use without an increase in the amount of recreational use of the drug in the state. Um, questions from the audience at this point. Just raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you. I, we'd, and, We'll move on from there. Yes, sir. Yeah, my name's Dave Outlaw. I, I had a couple questions, and I, and I know this is a, a, something that's it's, there's a reason for it. I don't necessarily think that mar legalizing marijuana for medical use is what it's all about. You want to be happy, you want to take something to make you happy, whether it's you know alcohol or whatever. You're going to do that. What we're asking is, okay, if you're going to you're going to let everybody be happy and do this, and you know, however whatever reason you want to be happy, how are you going to regulate it. And I th think the gentleman's point was, if we're doing such a poor job in alcohol and the other stuff, what, how are we going to regulate that? I don't understand what the reason why we want to do that. We've got these other al alternatives to make you happy. What's, what's the uh, advantage of, of adding one more? Let me reframe your question, because this is one that's been on my mind since this started tonight. And I'll ask it of all three of you. Why are we now talking about this? I said I started covering marijuana in 1974. I watched a criminalized, decrim decriminalized, recriminalized state of Ohio uh, a, a medical marijuana issue is there now, where I grew up. Each of you, why do you think we now have two states that have legal marijuana, um, a number of states that have medical marijuana, and a number of states, including the state of Florida, are now having medical marijuana referendums. Why is this happening now? You have been fighting this for a long time. This is not obviously where you thought it was heading. Why is it heading there now? Well, we went through this situation in the late 70s and early 80s with the glaucoma issue. And then we communicated all the problems that were occurring with the drug the parents listened. One of the problems that we have today is the pro-drug people, when I got a lot of friends, and I'm civil, decided that they were going to make this, I thought these were the working. Yeah, but there's, yours is for some reason malfunctioning. I want to make sure Gee. everything. 
I knew they were going to try to there, silence and, and, and I, I, I was going to cut off my mind. And, and, I, and I would say there's no, there is no plot. <laughs> I don't think there is no. at all. But what's happened is when my friends in California decided that they wanted to push for legalization, I knew they couldn't push it. They had a strategy session with the policy groups and they set up a long-range marijuana lobby campaign funded extremely well by some very wealthy people and their goal was to gradually cave in the American opposition to it with a program of medical marijuana. And they used the work that was done by synthetic cannabinoids to say this is marijuana. Anytime you do work on a synthetic cannabinoid or a natural occurring cannabinoid and report it, the opposition says, well, this is marijuana. And it has gained momentum. They took a long-term took a long-term view of it. And it gained momentum over time. And people really think it's medicine. But when you're high, you don't have any pain. And when you're using the product, you don't have any pain. So it has gained momentum based on that. And then they said, well, we're putting all kind of people in jail, which is really not the problem. And if we put our resources somewhere else, we do it. It's been a smooth, very nicely manipulated campaign of a con job. And you can throw me out of here, but that's the basically the way it is. Ben? Well, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm not part and parcel of, of this marijuana movement that, that uh, Mr. Turner's apparently friends with these folks. Uh, this is a campaign funded and run by Floridians for Floridians. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the fact of the matter is marijuana is medicine, and, and people believe this because, uh, because they see it every day. They see people that they know suffering, and they, and they hear stories of how marijuana helps people. And, I, you know, Dr. Turner, I'm sorry I called you Mr. earlier, Dr. Turner, um, just said, when you're high, you feel no pain. Well, so that does, doesn't that make marijuana an effective painkiller? Um, no. And, and by the way, when I, you know, when I, when I have a headache, I take Advil. Uh, 12,000 Americans die every year from non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, Advil, Tylenol, aspirin. Nobody's ever died from an overdose of marijuana. So marijuana well, eliminates pain and nobody's died from it. So how is it not medicine and why should people have to go to jail for, for eliminating the, the suffering that they have on a daily basis? Sheriff, you have been in law enforcement. This is your career. You have been dealing with drug law enforcement. I've guaranteed every step of the way. Right. Why do you think this is now coming up across the country? Well, I think, I think because it can, and I also think it's, it, it, there's a money factor with it. Um, just like uh, Purdue Pharma, which makes Oxy. Um, so about two months ago, look at all the problems we have with Oxycontin, Oxycodone, right? Uh, people dying from it, abuses of it, et cetera. What did they put on the market two months ago? A higher potency of Oxy. Why? Because they can make money from it. So I think it's a situation where these initiatives are um, funded now. It's because they can, uh, and because you have people that'll fund it and get it on the ballot. It, you know, it, it, it's, it, I, keep, I don't accept that weed, a weed, a plant is medicine. Um, and if people need you know, relief from pain, it's like saying, okay, you're gonna go drink a bottle of whiskey. Uh, you know, that's not medicine. And, and again, I keep coming back to this, and I don't know why, I don't know why it, it, it's not what some people want, it's not what they like, it's not what they desire. But keep coming back to this. There is THC in pill form that you can take that's going to give you pain relief, that's going to act as an appetite enhancer for those that need it. So everything that you can get, well, there's more stuff in it. We like the cannabinoids. We like some of this other stuff. But the real, the, the stuff that deals with pain, that deals with pain is THC. Well, then somebody says, well, what about the uh, CBD that's in there um, because that stops seizures? We can deal with that separately, and in fact, you know, the Florida legislature, there's a bill in front of the Florida legislature right now this session that, for the Charlotte's Web, which would um, allow CBD for kids with seizures. I don't have a problem with that whatsoever because it's not addictive. It's not what gets you high. It's not what relieves the pain, but it stops the seizures. Personally, others have an issue with it. I don't have an issue with CBD. Um, I, I don't know if it's going to pass or not, but so there's other ways to get at this. We'll come back to that, I think. Let's go back to the audience. Um, okay, right over here. Hi. Uh, something that I would like uh, to be discussed, right in Tampa, we have Cannabis College, and we have these other uh, colleges popping up that are teaching everyone how to make money once the dispensaries come out. I just would like that to be addressed because, um, as my husband's best saying is, I was born at night, but I wasn't born last night. And uh, quite honestly, um, the people that also want to talk about the FDA being bad and all of this, they'll be the first person 
that would sue when the drug wasn't available or the drug caused problems. So now I want those issues just talked about if we could possibly do let's, that. Let's go, Ben, your opportunity, because we've done a story on Cannabis College. Um, there have been a number of articles around the state about businesses training people to get involved in what they see as a potential uh, profit center. Um, what's your response to the charges that that's, well, what the sheriff just said, it's just really about money. Well, I mean, listen, first of all, uh, my, my friend Alex Sink is in the audience. She had a great quote, if there's a scheme to be cooked up, it's going to be cooked up here in Florida. And I think that's true. I mean, I think, I really think that the, the I've people... I've only been here a while, but I'm not arguing. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, th I think the people that are running these cannabis colleges are, you know, are, are somewhat hucksters and, and don't really know what they're talking about because, you know, we have a page and a half of amendment and a lot of the details are going to have to be filled in at, at the legislative level and with the State Department of Public Health. Um, but at the same time, you know, when this passes, what the, the ultimate goal of this amendment is to provide relief to the suffering patients in the state of Florida. And I, and I don't think you can do that without a robust commercial enterprise surrounding it. That doesn't mean that marijuana shops are going to have to proliferate on every street corner like, you know, like, the, like the sheriff would like us to believe here. Um, and the state is going to have to regulate this, and the state should regulate this. And this uh, can and should and will be a tightly controlled and regulated system for the production and distribution and sale of medical marijuana in the state of Florida unless unless our state bureaucrats at the State Department of Public Health abdicate responsibility and, and don't regulate the system under the amendment. So, you know, any, any sort of scare tactics of this is, this is going to go out of control uh, would really rely on the state just really dropping the ball on implementing the system. And I have, I have faith in the, in the lifelong government servants who work at the State Department of Public Health to put in place a system that looks like the state of Florida and, and works for the state of Florida. Carlton, you don't have faith that the uh, state of Florida could run a system like this? Well, the people here have said they have no faith in the FDA. And if the FDA no, can't I, I need run it, that, I need that clarified. I need that clarified. Could you clarify to me what, what does that statement mean? Because uh, well, while I've done a lot of reading about this, I don't know um, because the FDA won't approve marijuana as a drug. As a well, the medicine. FDA could never approve marijuana as a drug because it's a dirty drug and never get through. It'll approve individual components of it. But if the FDA and the DEA and the law enforcement regions that you have in Florida that are very good, the different agencies, can't regulate something that's controlled uh, as a scheduled drug, a prescription item, then how do you expect it to regulate something that's out there to be available whenever someone wants to, to go buy a dispensary and have a card to say, go to the dispensary and get it? So it's going to be a job. I'm not going to have to worry about it. That's going to be the sheriff's problems to worry about that. But I don't think you can regulate it. All right, we have a question back here. Um, one way for the microphone. Go ahead, sir. This is kind of, this is <laughs> kind of uh, on the same line. I think this idea of calling it medical yeah. is a smokescreen, and pardon the pun. Because, because doctors aren't prescribing it, and it isn't sold in a controlled environment. We don't sell OxyContin in dispensaries. Why in the heck are we going to have dispensaries selling marijuana? We sell OxyContin in the same doctor's office where you get the prescription for it. Marijuana, <laughs> mar marijuana, marijuana will be regulated under this amendment, and. Uh, you know, and, that, and that's just the facts. You, you, you have to, to, get to, to get to the position of, of the questioner, you have to ignore what is in black and white in the amendment and ignore what the, the Florida Supreme Court has said, that debilitating means debilitating, and you must be diagnosed with a debilitating disease or medical condition in order to qualify for the use of medical marijuana in the state of Florida. All right, um, another question, please. Uh, someone pick, okay, go ahead. I just wanted to say a comment that most drugs were are come from plants. Then they have synthesized yep. from those plants, which derived from the rainforest. That's where we come up with our medication is from plants. Okay. Anybody have a question? I'm interested in a question. How, how about a, a question okay. from from Kathy, whose uh, whose uh, name is on? The okay. Yeah, we did, her name's been brought up enough that she could be on the dais. So, um, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I did not plan to interrupt the gentleman when he was speaking, but he looked directly at me and asked me a question, would I take a pharmaceutical drug that I could? There is no pharmaceutical 
drug for ALS, New Gary's disease. I had the great fortune of living for 28 years with ALS, New Gary's disease, and that's because of cannabis. And your unknowledge of the endocannabinoid system is what will get me killed. Since 2001, the University of Amherst has been trying to study cannabis and the brain. The federal government shuts in them constantly. I am not in pharmaceutical drugs made out of cannabis. I am only here to protect the whole plane just as an And you do not know when you're playing looking to the endocannabinoid system and how ALS and Alzheimer's can be helped with cannabis. And you are not, um, you are not um, actually speaking the truth. But in the state of Florida, I have worked three years with Tallahassee trying to get this put in order because I knew I do not want this to be uh, a shop, um, a pot shop on every corner. But if our legislators will not do their job, then who is? Who is? Whose fault will this be when this does not turn out right? Whose fault will this be? Carlton, one point there. Um, she said there is no drug that she can take that's formed from a cannabinoid for her condition. Um, is she right or wrong? She's right. I don't think there's a lot of therapeutics for her condition. I have a friend that passed away from that, and I'm delighted that she's been able to survive this long. The only drugs that are available on the market is a drug called Salivax, which is a drug that's on the market for multiple sclerosis in Europe. It comes from the cannabis plant, but it's not marijuana. That's the point I'm trying to make. That is not marijuana. It's, it's a product that is in, from the cannabis plant. And the lady mentioned that natural products. I'm a pharmacognosist by training, and we study drugs of a natural origin. And you're absolutely correct. Over 51% of the drugs that you use today were discovered in plants. It's like, uh, let's say, Taxol, for those that have breast cancer. Taxol comes from the yew tree. It's, uh, it's a product that came from nature, but you don't go chew the leaves of the yew tree to get your Taxol. So the process we've gone through is to take the active components, process them out, get them in a pure form, and hopefully some will be coming through to help Kathy. There's another one called Sesamet, which has been on the market. It's actually a, a THC, a synthesis of it, that's been on the market. It treats pain. And you have a physician here, an oncologist, that writes prescriptions all the time for Marinol. So if it works, and it's a synthetic or it's a natural product, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Ben, but so the basic premise of your argument is that people like Kathy should wait and potentially die while pharmaceutical companies try to synthesize and eventually monetize these plants. That's ben, right? No, that's not the Marijuana argument. is medicine, but we've got to wait until we can make money off of it. Well, you make, you're going to make money off of the, the clinics, believe me. Ben, was there Not a pharmaceutical money? Was there a way? I, I don't know about the process and how one goes about trying to write an amendment like this. Was there a way to address Kathy and some of these other uh, cases without going to the length of trying to come up with the medical marijuana system in the state? Something that addresses these these really chronic cases. Is there a way that, was there a way to do that, or that this is well, the only way you could pull it off? Well, I mean, I guess a couple things on that. Are you talking about like a list? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm just thinking we can see where the issue breaks down here. Right. I mean, I think, so, you know, one of the big arguments that we've heard against this amendment right now is it's too broad. A doctor can prescribe it for, for uh, you know, a headache or menstrual pain. And by the way, not being a woman, I would never want to, to tell somebody that menstrual pain is not a debilitating uh, medical condition. So, Point um, but, but our, our basic position in drafting this was, was that this is not a decision that me as a political consultant or, or, you know, John Mills, our lawyer as a constitutional scholar or a bureaucrat in Tallahassee or a politician in Tallahassee or the attorney general should decide. This is an issue that should be decided between a doctor and their patient. 
And I think that that's the bottom line of it. And the other, the other part of it is medical marijuana is already legal in the state of Florida. We have a well-established medical necessity defense in the state of Florida, which is why Kathy Jordan is sitting here today, which is why when police officers knocked at her door, they did not arrest her. The state attorney did not prosecute her. Uh, we have this codified in, into, into the law here through, you know, through lots of precedent. Sure, um, but you're... what we want to do is, is provide safe access and, and make it so that you know, not only does she not get prosecuted, but the police never knock on her door in the first place. Sure, have you ever run into that in Pinellas County? No, but, but, but if it's already legal, then what do we need this for? Well, I just yeah, told I you, mean, so that, so that yeah, Kathy Jordan can get her medicine without that. having to worry about, yeah, uh, you know, uh, officers with guns and, and ski masks knocking on her door and then and ultimately taking her plants, uh, which, which is her yeah, medicine. Just, just, wait, just wait. Yeah, She's not. Not, she was not arrested. She was not arrested. Again, she didn't go to jail, but they took her medicine and they and they dragged her out of her house and it was and it was not a pleasant situation. I don't know if that's something you want to go through to, to try to to try to get get through your day and ease your suffering and, and simply stay alive with a horrible with a horrible medical condition like ALS. But that's why we're doing this to provide safe access to patients and and, and positive access, not, not having to go to your state attorney and argue that you're so sick that you need marijuana that they shouldn't press charges on you, that because you're sick and because your doctor said you need marijuana, you should just be able to have it. Continuing, uh, uh, Carlton. There is, there is Carlton says there is there, a way. There is a way that's been used since the 7th. It's called a compassionate IND. It's an investigative new drug application. All your physician has to do is get together and have it done, and then you get material from the Mississippi Project with a standardized grade of marijuana, known how it's produced. It's now called an expanded use IND. There, there, it, there, it is not closed. Again, there's, one there's one opening in Miami shortly. There's no. No, there are 30 patients. I talked to the people yesterday. It's an expanded use IND, um, and it is available. Now, Kathy would be getting stuff from the government, standardized, known dosage, if she were in that program. I'll be happy to. I'll be happy to work the best I can with it to get it. All right, and another question from the audience. Back here. Go ahead. Hello. As a student of public policy, um, it's been in my experience that we could all, in turn, benefit from more scientific-based evidence and policy. And what I'm hearing today is um, really a lack of data to substantiate the fact that there aren't medicinal properties to marijuana. Um, I have data to back this up. In 1937, there was actually 27 legal uses of prescribed legal marijuana. And they were distributed by what's now known as Bristol Myers, Eli Lilly. Um, after the Marijuana Prohibition Tax Act in 1937, this was reversed. Um, then again, you have this issue saying that things have just reared their head and that it doesn't support um, the pain relief for terminal illness. In 1990, a scientific survey by the Journal of Clinical Oncology for Cancer Patients, um, this was a survey of physicians, stated that 44% had already suggested at least once that a patient obtain marijuana illegally to ease their suffering. So if it really comes down to the fact that we in the last 10 years have come out with a lot of scientific-based evidence from cutting-edge leaning universities all over the world, as well as supported by legal um, professional organizations that support the legalization of medicinal marijuana to ease people's suffering. Why is it still a contentious issue when the data is out there? You say the data is not. Oh, no, was, was Sheriff, you want to go first? Well, it, it, we keep coming back to this issue about whether marijuana has a good effect, whether it has a bad effect, whether about it, but, but it, it, Focus on the ballot amendment itself. Why, okay, in this ballot amendment? And it goes back to your question from a second ago about this ballot amendment and how loose it is. So even if you accept, even hypothetically you accept, okay, that it has uh, medicinal value, it has medical value, and you can make the case about in, in a scientific way. Why have they put this on the ballot where you got a 21-year-old who can be a convicted felon, who has no medical training whatsoever, um, who can be a caregiver for up to five people, can, can then distribute this or give it to a 16-year-old. Why do we have such a loose definition of a physician? It could be a podiatrist, it could be anybody, it could be a chiropractor, it just says physician. Why has this thing been, been put on the ballot so loosely if the real intention wasn't just to create this whole loose environment that leads to more than what it's intended for? Then obviously you need to respond to that. I believe that, that lies yeah. in the implementation. <laughs> in designing a policy, we have to consider the implementation and all Cor the possible stakeholders. Cor correct. And the, and, the reason, and the reason that we have to put this on the ballot and have to put it on one page back and forth that people can go out and sign a petition to get it on the ballot is because the legislature 
has denied this year after year after year, has refused to give it a hearing in the state, in the state legislature, despite, uh, despite both the scientific and unscientific polls that show that a vast, vast majority of Floridians want to see this and want to support this. Um, that, that's why we have to put it on the ballot. And again, you know, saying, saying what the sheriff just said here about um, the definition of caregiver, yeah, again, we had, a, we had a page and a half to define caregiver. The State Department of Public Health is directed to, to implement those definitions, and, uh, and I cannot envision a scenario in which, in which a, a registered caregiver under the state of Florida is allowed to be a, a felon. And I, would, and I would go to Tallahassee and lobby against that, and I, and I would think that, that Kathy would as well, and I would think most people in this room would, despite how they feel about the issue. I would like to so just you're, take... You're attaching, you're attaching things to the amendment that simply do not exist there. All right. Um, on this issue, in terms of public policy and data, I would like both of you to give me the best place for people to go to see the data to support your issue. Where's the best place to go, Ben, for me to, to, to be convinced that you're on the right track? You can go to our website, unitedforcare.org, which has a lot of this good information. Uh, you can also watch the two hour long documentaries that Dr. Sanjay Gupta produced for CNN on the issue, which I think go well above my head um, as, as a political consultant, but really sum up the issue. For very well. Carlton? There are bibliographies that chronalize the scientific literature that's peer reviewed. Where, where do I find them? Uh, you can find them at the Drug Free America Foundation. I've written two of them. Uh, and you can go to the University of Mississippi where it was initiated. And it has all the scientific literature broken down to the brain and all the other things. Now let me ask this latest question back here. One minute if I might. What you had on the market in the 30s that Lilly and the others put on the market was not marijuana as you know it today. It was an extract, a purified extract. What Lilly has done is put the product on the market, Nabilone, for pain. It's on the market, was on the market in 85. So you have policy that's driven by science, and that's where you stand on that. And if you want to look at the scientific literature, look at the scientific peer-reviewed literature, the clinicals, the whole bit. All right, we're going to go back for questions. Sir? Sure. The American Medical Association calls for further adequate and well-controlled studies of marijuana, and this is actually within the last couple of years. They believe that effective patient care requires the free and unfettered exchange of information on treatment alternatives, and the discussions of these alternatives between physicians and patients should not be subject either party to criminal sanctions. I, I, have, I agree with you 100% that you do the research and come up with the data, but the American Medical Association does not endorse marijuana as a medicine. All right, we're going to move on. Next question. Uh, I just had two things real quick. First point, and, and Sheriff, no disrespect to you, but going back to the fact of teenagers and kids, because of now if there's dispensaries out there, they can just go get it. Well, I hate to break this to you, but those same teenagers and kids can get it right now today as much as they want. I would even have to say, and this is just me guesstimating, but probably 70% of the people in this room smoke pot, and I wouldn't doubt 95% of the people in this room have tried it. So when it goes to kids, trust me guys, if kids want it, they get it right now, five minutes from now, wherever in the state of Florida. I'm sorry, but that's the facts. I mean, the bottom line, it's the truth. Now, is it, is now there, the, the other thing I wanted to hit real quick was, you were talking about Colorado. Well, the state of Colorado came out yesterday, the state of Colorado came out yesterday with an announcement that since they have went recreational, since the first month, it has declined 15% every month. They were expecting 34 million in tax revenues. They're only getting 15. So just by going legal recreational, it's no big deal. It actually has declined. So the, the, the use of recreational. So the state of Colorado has already come out and said, I, I it's it. not booming. It's actually tapering off. They're All right. Not, they're sure. not getting the tax. Just quickly, and following your, lo following your logic about the kids. OK. Can we have the, the sheriff? following your logic about the kids, and because they can get access to it, we should just allow this. Following that logic, then what we should do is reduce the legal drinking age to five years old. Okay? That doesn't make any sense. No, no, that, that's, that's not what he was saying. I think yeah. what he was saying was that 
it, when when you have a black market scenario, anybody can get it. When you have a, a regulated when you have a regulated system, it makes it much more oh, difficult oh, for look, people not oh, intended to get that's, it. To that get is it. so nonsense. Look at oxycotton, oxycodone. You get it right down here on Park Boulevard, and there's a medical clinic called Dollar Medical. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to a place called Dollar Medical. Well, look at look at, look at tobacco. Look at tobacco. Tobacco that, that, uses that that consistently that dropped over years. All right, we're 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 gonna take a deep breath and have another question. Right here. Hi, my question is for Ben. <laughs> um, as a campaign manager for United for Care, um, do you personally truly believe that Amendment 2 is about medicine and not about the recreational use of marijuana? Yes. Yes, and for the reasons that I just said here, uh, again, if, if you want to recreationally use marijuana, it is not difficult to do so. And under our amendment, we, we structured it in such a way to make it so that, you know, to the extent possible, only the sickest people who really need it will get it. And there are a lot of hoops that you have to jump through in order to get it. Um, so when you can walk down the street and buy marijuana illegally, you have no reason to have to go to a doctor, pay a fee, go, go through it, get a diagnosis of a debilitating disease, send it to the Department of Health, get an ID card that has a timeline that you're going to have to get renewed if you want to keep using it. You might as well just go down the street and buy it illegally. So yes, this is for the sickest people and that's why we're doing this. So then right. why did you tell, Mike, it's two part, then why did you say to the Associated Press in regards to registering voters to cast absentee ballots, why did you say we want to be able to have our stereotypical lazy pothead voters to be able to vote from their couch? if you really believe that it's about medicine. Well, we Why did you we, say that? We need to get to 60%. People need to vote on this, and, and whether they're smoking pot recreationally or not. Is that what you I said, think, Ben? I did say that. It was, not, it was not the smartest thing that I've said during the course of the campaign, I, okay? Uh, but it, but it, it, is, it is true, right? We want, we want people who are the most likely to support this, and I think you know the recreational potheads are very likely to support this issue. We want them to be able to vote. Now, I appreciate your candor. Um, another question from the audience, um, right here. Thank you so much. I have a question for the sheriff, and, and I personally, I've been out on the streets collecting petitions for years, and I've talked to dozens, hundreds of patients, including patients who have really serious debilitating conditions. Medical marijuana isn't just about pain or pain relief or feeling good. I mean, the federal government sold patents for the antioxidant qualities. And what's the question? To, and the question is, as taxpayers, a lot of our tax dollars go to enforcement of the current drug laws. And I know personally that a lot of those folks whose homes are raided are patients. And how does it benefit us to use our tax dollars to go into the homes of patients and treat them as criminals and take a safe medicine away from them? Because I know it does happen. You said it didn't. But I've talked to so many folks with very serious conditions who that exactly has happened to. And Kathy experienced well, that, unfortunately, as well. Okay, let, let's share. Well, it, it hasn't happened here in Pinellas County. It hasn't well, happened by the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office. That's all I can tell you. So I can't. Oh I, 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 I'm sorry, that's not true. I know for well, a fact well, that the Sheriff's Office does not regard a patient as any different than another grow house operator. It ha it's happened in my family. So I beg to differ. Well, All right, thank you. There's, 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 you have begged to differ now, sir. Well, you're, you're talking about grow house, grow house no, operators. Sir, I'm okay. about two ounces of marijuana with yeah, a man well. with a steel plate in his neck. Well, that's what I, I'm talking about. I'll show you the records if you'd like to see them. Well, then I'd show like them to, to me. But, but, but when you get, you, get, you, you get to this, and you get to this issue, and, and why? Why is there an appeal? Why do you want the, whatever you called it, the armchair laying on the couch, pot smoking pot head to vote for this? Why do they want to vote for it? Why does that person who wants to, who's laying on the couch, as you said, that, that, I don't do, care do why they want, they want to vote. Oh, for I know why they want, because they want it for recreational right. use. That's why. Again, uh, rules of decorum. Use. Once once more, I'm going to bring this up. Rules of decorum. Passions, if you cannot control your passions and allow this to be an answer and a question, we're not having a debate tonight. We're having an informal, informational discussion. If you cannot control your passions, you need to leave the room because there are those here who do want to hear all of the sides. I don't want to be the stern master. I don't want to wrap anybody on the knuckles here, but we're not getting anywhere when we break down this way. We're not progressing, and I think everybody in this room would like something to progress. Now, Sheriff. 
It, well, it, well, I'd have to know the specific. I can tell you that, that we prioritize our limited resources that we have, okay? And I can tell you that, that our policy as far as uh, grow houses and grow operations are concerned is, is that with that, unless we get a complaint on it, we're not out there every single day looking for people who are growing that pot plant on the windowsill. We got to prioritize our resources, and that's something that we've done for a long time. So, so, share with you everything I have. so it, you know, but we're, we're not doing it. I can tell you we're not doing it. We're not going after these people. Um, again, we have limited resources, and we have to focus on uh, those things that are most serious crime. Next question, back here. Hi, I'd like to go back to something that the sheriff said before about the chiropractor um, right. being a dispenser. Okay, so he, the chiropractor gives a dispenser card to someone who has a back injury. They get high. They go out and kill my daughter. There's no criminal liability. There's no civil liability. No. Where does a parent, what kind of loophole does this create, and how yeah. would you close it? Well, it, the, the amendment does say that there's complete civil uh, and criminal uh, immunity uh, as to these people who are the ones who certify. But you as a parent, guess what? You're not immune because if your daughter gets her hands on some of that pot that was certified and somebody right. gets it and your daughter goes out in your car and kills somebody, you don't get immunity. Your employers don't get it. If you're an employer, you don't get immunity if one of your employees is out and kills somebody. Right. So that all of the, the users, the dispensers, the certifiers, they're all immune. But the people who have really the most liability no. in this, they're not immune. No, that, that is simply incorrect. That, that nothing about this law changes the existing DUI or DWI laws that we have on the books. Yeah, but what and, about and this liability issue that it keeps, it keeps coming up here tonight? So um, answer this. Are those dispensers um, not liable for something that goes wrong with someone they dispense marijuana to? No, is, is, is a pharmacist liable for, for filling a prescription that it, that's, a, that's a legally written prescription? I, I'm unaware. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I, sure, sure, sure they would be. Professional, I mean, it says right here in black and white. You can read it in the amendment, so you don't want to answer the question because you didn't answer the question directly. Well, first of all, the chiropractor black, can't prescribe it under well, the amendment. Say I, have that a, in here. I, I have an email from the Department of Public Health that says that. And licensed Florida physician. Chiropractors are not physicians. Chiro Chiropractors are not physicians. Say Chiro that. Chiro it, 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 it says anyway, licensed Florida it, physician. It, Chiropractors it, are not physicians. On the immunity issue, it says in any here physician Blatton. would be insulted to, to you know have somebody say that a chiropractor is a physician. There, but what about the immunity issue? I, I guess I'm it, looking for it, a direct it, answer. It, about it says that. here black and white. It says what is what is the, what is the ballot did? What does the ballot initiative say concerning physician immunity under the ballot issue? Phys physicians are, are immune from criminal or civil. You, you no, it says actions and conduct by a medical marijuana treatment center registered with the department or its employees as permitted by this section by, shall not be subject to criminal or civil liability or sanctions under Florida law. And it goes on for, for all of these other people too. So it, it clearly says that anybody who certifies, anybody who dispenses, anybody who is using pursuant to this there is complete criminal and civil immunity. It's well, not complete, though. It's, 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 uh, it's consistent with the text of the amendment. So if, if a doctor is, a, is abusing the system, if a doctor is prescribing or, or recommending for non-debilitating conditions for, for anything, then that is not consistent with the amendment, which is, which is written for people in the state of Florida with debilitating diseases and medical conditions. I can tell you, in reality, is, is that when it says that, in trying to determine that the person is practicing outside the scope of care is next to impossible. Why the is that, why is is that language in there? What is the, it's to protect the doctor from if the, if the patient dies from the disease they have? Why, I know you have to parse language in these ballot issues, and it's looked over very carefully. Why is that language necessary in, in the amendment? To, to, pr to, protect, to protect doctors from, you know, from mass lawsuits as a result of, of uh, marijuana. Okay. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not to, to just shield doctors entirely from, from uh, you know, prescribing throughout the course of, of, of this amendment, but, but to protect them from frivolous lawsuits. Okay, another question over here. Ben Pallara, Sheriff Bob, Dr. Turner, and our host, Greg. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time, for having this discussion. Um, I have but one question for you, gentlemen, and it's regarding the first and second amendment. Amendment. You guys keep talking about medicine and drugs. What about my spiritual right to partake of cannabis and worship God the way I see fit? I, I don't have anything to say about that. Uh, okay. <laughs> Just have a small flashback. Um, <laughs> where are we going? Uh, 
right here. No, no. I have a question, doctor. Um, I keep hearing uh, aches and pains, that term thrown around. I want to know what you say to a mother who has a child who has AMPS, Amplified Musculoskeletal Pain Syndrome. He's been on 30 different medications. His poor little body has been racked for years because of pharmaceuticals. We have seen 25 different doctors across the country, one of them in Harvard, who recommended cannabis oil for him for his pain. So what do you say to a mother who watches her child every single day suffer through pain, who can't sleep, who can't eat because the pain is so bad? They put him in medical-induced comas for days at a time. So, you know what that looks like? So I would like to know what you would say to a mother who is watching her child die and waste away, and this after pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical have failed this is the medication that's recommended. What do, you, what do you say for his aches and pains? I have a grandson with special needs. I have as much passion as anyone has. But what that doctor is recommending is not marijuana. That's an extract of cannabis that is purified for a particular purpose. And there are products on the market that are working their way through the system for that. Well, which... I'm just telling you what he recommended is a purified product that he knows will not create harm. First thing is do not create any harm. And I don't know what he recommended. I haven't seen it. I don't know what's in it. Uh, but that's not marijuana. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about smoked marijuana here as a, quote, medicine, not accepted by any medical authority organization in the world. If the doctor recommended that and they can provide that, I'd say try it. Right over here. Yes, my name is Hayden Falk. I'd like to ask these two experts up here where they think they got their information about Marinol being so good. Uh, I'm a cancer patient up at Moffitt. I've been there six years fighting a non-curable cancer. I'm a guinea pig. There are 450 of us. I've been in four clinical trials. Of that group, there are 80% being given a chill-out drug. That's Xanax, Valium, Ativan, Prozac. It goes on and on and on. They're all addictive. That same 450 of us are getting, 50% of them are getting a pain pill. Oxys, Roxys, Percocet, Vicodin. goes on and on and on. Those are all addictive. I've never taken one pill in that whole six years. I use marijuana. I have to score it off the street. Yes. Pay three to four hundred dollars to get it. Should be paying a hundred and twenty to a hundred and fifty dollars to be getting it. But I went through a stem cell transplant. They didn't give me. When you lose your appetite, it's for your 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 taste buds are lost for maybe five or six weeks. They said Marinol doesn't really work well. It's too highly controlled. We can't give it to you. But I can tell you. I've got 42 years experience around marijuana. I'm not some pothead. I started a, a successful multi-million dollar business on $600. Question. And question. Question. I already gave him the question. Okay. Why do the two experts in the think that Marinol is so good? I question your other, your other expertise because you don't know really much about Marinol. Well, Marinol is Delta 9 THC extracted from the cannabis plant. And it's gone through the process of phase one, phase two, phase three. It's not going to work for everyone. Every medical therapeutic item out there it doesn't work for everyone. But there are others out there that can be used. The other one is Navalone, which is a synthetic product, and it's for pain. But THC does relieve pain. I don't want to let anyone go away from here and does not understand that THC does have pain reducing capabilities but the pain reducing capabilities are not sufficient enough to reduce all of your pain in most people so i can't tell you what is going on with your system but i can merely tell you that salivex has gone through the process it's used in europe not used here but that's a different one that marinol is here and that uh, i think uh, nabalone now is called uh, uh, sesamet i believe is what it's called and it's for pain and it's for appetite suppressant. That's all I can tell you. It would cost me $1,200 a month to 
to use Marinol. And I would, yeah, I would offer a suggestion to you. I would offer a suggestion to you to have your cancer clinic to file an expanded use IND. Once that expanded use IND, and it takes two to three months, depending upon how you get the paperwork in, and none that I know of has been refused to turn down, and then you would be able to get government regulated produced marijuana on a regular basis. But you have to go through the regulatory process, and I'll be happy to talk to you about that and get you in contact with people if you wish. I'm, I'm kind of interested in that. Um, so marijuana does, in your opinion, have some medical application? I've said that. About yeah, 15 said different it all times. throughout here. Marijuana is medicine. Yes. There are components in the cannabis plant. Right, but I'm talking about I'm talking about the plant where you put it in a pipe and you put a match to it and you inhale it. That's the worst case to get a drug. You cannot titrate the drug properly. And that's the reason we don't go eat moldy bread for penicillin. We don't go eat soil all for tetracyclines. We have a process. And there is a regulatory process. It's called expanded use IND, investigative new drug. It's an experimental drug, and you can get that through the process. That's what will be happening in Miami shortly with Charlotte's Web. It's not Charlotte's Web. It is a product produced by a pharmaceutical company that's an extract of cannabis that doesn't have THC in it because the last thing you want to give a young child is THC. And there are other programs underway, one in Chicago. There are one beginning in Massachusetts next week. There are ways to do this that gets the people what they want and, and under control conditions so they don't have to worry about how it's grown. All right, another question. Um, let's go back over here. Thank you. I appreciate you being here, and I have my question is this. There's not a person in this room on either side of the issue that does not have compassion for these people that are suffering and for the children that are suffering. Nobody, I, I don't think anybody disagrees with me, correct? And the problem with this whole thing is that it gets presented as an all or nothing. Either we legalize it and open up pot shops all over the place, or, you know, we don't. It's not the way the issue actually is. Um, there are things in place, or that should be what we're addressing if they're not adequate to help these specific people not open up a pot dispensary on the, on the corner next to Walgreens. Uh, in, on the radio this morning, they announced that in Colorado, Walmart is now going to start selling pot. <laughs> so I ask you this. Here's my question. If this is truly a medical issue to help the people that are suffering and the children that are suffering, why, within a very short period of time after the language of this bill was sorted out, was there a bill in the House and the Senate of the state of Florida to legalize recreational use marijuana, if that is not the ultimate plan? Ben. Well, I mean, so, so I. I guess the questions about the bills in the House and the Senate, I mean, the, those bills are never going to get a hearing. They're, they're, uh, they were introduced by Democrats who have, as uh, me being one of them, have zero power in Tallahassee. So I, I, I don't think it, it's really a relevant issue. Well, I don't well, I mean, again, this, this is, you know, Amendment 2 authorizes the use of medical marijuana for, for qualifying patients with debilitating diseases and medical conditions. It says it in the amendment in black and white, as the sheriff likes to say, it, it Affir the Supreme Court of the state of Florida, which they are called Supreme for a reason, uh, affirms that uh, it is for debilitating. Uh, the word debilitating actually means debilitating, despite what our attorney general might tell you. Uh, it's for debilitating diseases and medical conditions, period. End of story. It's not about legalized marijuana. This is about helping sick people. Do we have a question over here? So I have a question um, for the sheriff. Uh, as far as control goes, and you were saying like anybody, a felon, can take someone and get this card. but like I think what's not being addressed is a felon or anyone at all, someone that just got out of jail can go to a hospital. I see it, I'm a nursing student, I see it all the time. Anyone in this room can walk into a hospital and say, I have a pain, I have a headache, I got a toothache, I have any, you could say I have back pain, anything at all. They will almost always not do any test on you at all, not even see if drugs are in your system, prescribe you 30 days of whatever kind of medication the way that they get around what kind of medication they get is, I'm allergic to Vicodin, I'm allergic to this, I'm allergic to that, I'm allergic to that. All I can take is this. The doctor says, okay, it's ER, it's busy, I don't have time for this. 
Here's your oh. script. Go take a follow-up. So I'm just, I, my question is, what's, what's the difference between regulating this as far as controlling it and th what's well, going on right now as far as pills go? Uh, the felons are out there getting prescription drugs, not from pill mills, but from going to the hospital and getting them. Well, Drug well, addicts, that, they that, use I mean, that's, that's a problem with the practitioners that are writing those prescriptions and dispensing it. I mean, if you just say, if you walk into an emergency room and say, and you got a sore back or whatever, and you're allergic to all these things, you're really not, and the, the doctor's just writing a script to get you out of there because you said they're too busy. Well, that's a problem with the system. That, that has nothing to do with this. That, that's, a, that's a whole different issue. Yeah. It's like if you're bringing up the same problem with regarding marijuana, you're saying that's going to be a problem with marijuana. Well, it's not a problem. Well, two wrongs don't make a right. <laughs> you know, I mean, just because it, 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 will, it, will, it will continue to be a problem, it'll be worse of a problem uh, because you're going to have these dispensaries with certifications at, le at, at least, at least. That doctor is writing a prescription. It's limited. You're going to have, you know, 10 pills or whatever it is with no refills on it. Here, you're going to go to somebody who is unscrupulous, who hangs out dollar medical signs on Park Boulevard. You're going to get your certification, and you can go get pot as much as you want. Ben, the, diff the difference is the drugs you're talking about kill people every single day, and, and the and the other and the other difference is. They're, they're physically addictive and they kill people, period, end of story. Marijuana has never killed a human being. That's not okay, true. And you also, under our amendment, you will not be able to walk into a hospital or any doctor's office and walk out with marijuana. You would, again, have to get the written certification from the physician, send it to the Department of Public Health, get an identification card from the Department of Public Health. You couldn't do what you just described. Okay, go ahead, sir. Uh, I'd like to ask the panel to um, tell us, assuming a positive result in November, Walk us through the implementation of this amendment. Let's we'll start with you, Ben. Yep. Um, the amendment is approved in no on November the 4th. Then what happens? So, <laughs> yes, we would all cheer. Uh, yeah, so, so the amendment is approved on November 4th. It becomes effective January 6th. Uh, the State Department of Public Health has six months from January 6th to write all the rules and regulations surrounding how the amendment will be implemented in the state of Florida. Uh, we then have nine months from January 6th to actually begin implementing those and, and issuing patient identification cards, issuing uh, registrations to medical marijuana treatment facilities and, and figuring out how the whole system works. And that, and that time period would encompass an entire legislative session so the legislature could weigh in as well, and I'm, and I'm sure they will, and they could, uh, even though I believe and the Department of Public Health believes that chiropractors can't prescribe medical marijuana under this amendment, legislature could pass a law specifically saying that, and that would not be inconsistent with this amendment. Are th they could also tighten up DUI and DWI laws to, to account for this, you know, what, what the sheriff warns is this surge of marijuana use that I don't believe will occur, but, but they, can, they could do that. Would, it, have you, would, they have, would the law enforcement have any input in that implementation phase? Do you know? well, of course. The Department of Public Health has a, has a rulemaking process right. which, which asks for public input, and, and you know, the, the, the sheriffs would be asked, as would everybody in this room. We would all have input into this the, process. The, the, basically, this debate would be replicated in, 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 under the Ford Administrative Code. Uh, they would pro promulgate these regulations, and, the, and he's right. There is a whole process with that, and it, it would be, but there are specific timetables in here, in, in there, that they have to do it, and the, that require them to do it in certain timetables. So the debate will probably be fairly limited, because they have to do something fairly quickly, but it, it, it will be, the answer Herb's question is, is that it will be a highly debated, hotly debated, uh, extensive uh, rulemaking process. Well, and I don't think it's going to be over after nine months. It'll keep, keep being debated. No. Correct. No. I think people need to understand that. There is a time lag between November 4 and implementation. Yes. Correct. Okay, thanks. Another question back over here. Go ahead. All right, my question is, um, we've heard a lot about the morality of the issue. Um, We've also heard about choices that Florida has to make, um, and it is going to be a choice. And just by the poll that's been taken, it's like 70 percent. I've heard numbers as high as 70 percent are for it. Kind of going to what he said, um, if it is passed on November 4th, what kind of a financial impact will it have on the state of Florida? Uh, will this create jobs? Will this create revenue? Uh, what kind of financial impact are we talking about for the state of Florida? And what possible negative impacts, I guess. Um, positive impacts? Start there. I, I mean, again, we're, we're, doing this, we're doing this for sick Floridians who, who are desperate for marijuana as, as medicine. So, I mean, we're not doing this as a, as a job creator, but I, I've seen estimates that this could create 
you know, somewhere close to a billion dollars a year in new economic generation in the state of Florida. But that, again, that, that is not why we're doing this. We're doing this to bring relief to people who are suffering. So sure. if jobs are created, you know, that's great, but that's not the purpose of the amendment. Sure. Well, uh, and you can see all the photos of these medical marijuana dispensaries out in California that have neon signs that say open 24 hours. Uh, and that you have people wearing the placard standing on the street corner that say, uh, med medical marijuana certification physicals for 200 bucks. So I'm sure it'll create some of those jobs. Those aren't the kind of jobs we how want. How similar though. is this one to? The, how similar is this amendment to California's amendment? I mean, I've I, I've seen the same thing that the sheriff's is. No, of course, I, I, and I have too. I mean, Cal California basically legalized marijuana in 1996. It is it is only loosely in the loosest definition of the word a, me a medical marijuana system there i mean you you can a, a, an oral recommendation from your physician suffices people can grow it at their own home a and the state has never regulated it uh, the state has never put any rules or regulations in place which is why you see like what the sheriff talked about with particular municipalities banning it because they have to because their legislatures have abdicated responsibility in regulating the system just as our legislatures Legislators have abdicated responsibility in creating a medical marijuana system in the state of Florida that, that the voters have been asking for. Carlton, is there any legalized marijuana in this country that seems to be working in your estimation? Depends on how you define as working. Uh, I know the sick people say, getting medicine. Are, are sick people yeah. getting relief through the marijuana that they say gives them the relief? Well, if you look at real sick people, the one with cancer and AIDS and others, are not the one using it. If you look at the data and the difference, I, I'm just saying the data in the different states. I'm not saying individuals, ma'am. I'm saying the data. You have over 90% of them for pain. You don't have them for AIDS and the others. Now, I want to say one thing about the young man's question here. Uh, you talk about the economic benefit. If you look at the economic benefit, everybody says, well, let's, let's legalize it and tax it. That's a wonderful idea up front. But if you look at what you've done with alcohol, and I just I brought this data, if you take the social cost of alcohol and, and the cost of uh, tax, this country gets $14 billion a year in tax off of alcohol. And if you look at what the National Institute on Alcohol and Alcohol and Drug Abuse says, it's 185 to 235 billion in cost. So the money that the state may generate would probably be spent more times than other in the treatment. Let me go back. Of the treatment, the people go in the emergency room for this drug. They're young people. And that's a cost you have to figure in when you deal with this. I have not seen one that works well like it should. Is the marijuana that will be used in the system in Florida taxed in any way? Is there a, a benefit to the state that, in terms of money? That would, that would be up to the, the legislature to decide. If that's not part of the amendment. No, the, the Department of Public Health could put fees on, on the system to, to make up for the cost of actually administering the system, but in terms of taxes, the legislature would have to put that on there. Do we have another question out here? Can you get to the middle? We, you know, yeah, the middle gets ignored, so we're going to get to the middle. Here we go. All right, what's your question? Okay, I think I understand. Um, the political consultant's position. I think I understand the sheriff's position. My question is for Dr. Turner. Um, you talk about like medicinal medicines and everything else, and we all watch the news, um, and you see all the commercials for. You watch the news at night between you know six thirty and seven, and all you see are these ads for these pharmaceutical drugs, and more of the commercial is spent. These are the side effects. So is my question is is there? You say that the FDA will, not, and I'm a proponent of the FDA. Um, you say that the FDA will not approve, you know, medical marijuana. One, is it because it's smoked? And two, is there a study out there that, you know, like all these other drugs, they have to go through the process of FDA approval and everything else. Is there a study out there on smoking medical marijuana? Because, I mean, as an informed voter, and I like to think of myself as one, and way to go, BA in history, um, I love knowing things, and I don't think there's enough information out there for people who don't know enough. So is there any studies that have been done that show the medicinal Sorry. effects of marijuana? The studies that have been done are on individual cannabinoids, because as I mentioned before... Nobody has done a study where they give people something to smoke and no, see if it... Because no self-respecting researcher is going to do that because you can't come in, you cannot get a concentration. Now, the first study was done was done with on glaucoma, 
at with Dr. Ira Franks in San Francisco. But when you go through a phase one, phase one study is safety. A phase two is efficacy, and a phase three is dosage. But to get to that phase one, you gotta go through all the animal studies. And I'm telling you, if you remember the thalidomide, you remember thalidomide? It, no, the, drug. The, the drug thalidomide that created birth defects. You take cannabis and all the constituents in it, and you subject that smoke, and you subject to just a crude extract of that, you get teratogenesis, and you get effects in two generations out of animals. So the FDA is never going to take the chance to put that on the market. But they will put something on the market that goes through it, such as a synthetic. And the extra extracts, which are not marijuana, that's where everybody's confused. The pro-drug people want to use anything good about anything and say it's marijuana. The products out there for the treatment of these kids with epilepsy is an extract. It is not marijuana. And that's where Gupta was disingenuous when he called everything marijuana. And that's a confusing issue. Do you have something on that, Ben? No, I, okay. it, listen, it, it is marijuana. And, and marijuana needs to be studied more. And, and we need to get to, to a better place of having information about this. But the reason that it can't is because it, it is a Schedule One DEA drug, which the, the, the DEA says it has no acceptable medical use. And so the FDA and these pharmaceutical companies cannot conduct the research that they need to into drugs that you know, the, the various component parts of have shown, have shown enormous promise uh, throughout the year. This may, this may be... That's totally wrong. This, this, this may be... Totally wrong. Uh, this may be it off... It is very the, difficult to right. conduct studies of marijuana. This may be totally off the base here, but she raises a question, and you're a doctor, and you're here, so I want, I want an answer. Why do, when I watch television at night and I see those commercials, <laughs> there's 15 seconds at the end of it telling me everything it's going to potentially do wrong to me. Because <laughs> they don't want to be sued, and right. the Federal Trade Commission requires okay. it. And right. they do not, the FDA does not approve any drug. They approve a item that says it will do this. They don't approve the drug. They approve the label. All right. Good enough. Thank you. One more. Oh, well, let's do one more. Let's, or do you want to, you want to, we run out of time? We, we are down to the last question, but I want to... Uh, have one more survey before we go. Okay, to let's do that. Um, I'm sorry, we, we do have to keep to time here. Um, and um, it's been spirited and informative and passionate. And I, I want to make sure that everyone understands that I only try to dampen the passion to continue the discussion. And that's it. Wait, and that's don't, really don't it. Don't go away. Don't go away. Don't go away. We have another survey. We want you to you vote on our last survey. So leave, please don't leave. Won't. They're going back to the survey. Oh, okay. Okay, here we go. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, where am I? Okay. Um, the survey is, the questions are somewhat di different today uh, for this uh, third one. If you uh, do not want to see this passed in any form, it's none, three. If you would approve of it being in non-smokable form only, no smoke three. If you would use it, uh, like to see it passed in any form for medical use only, it's any three. And if you would like to see it approved for any use, including recreational, it's all three. And we'll take about five minutes to give everybody time to uh, uh, vote. If you need help, please signal for someone on the staff. One final question. While you're voting, we can take, we have time for one final question. Uh, back here, over here to the, oh, you want to fight? Go ahead. Go ahead. Like the 45,000 kids that were in the emergency room, 15 to 17 years old, and it was only marijuana, nothing else in their system, right? And it wasn't like the K2 stuff that was doing all that stuff. I don't understand what the question was. He said the 45,000 teenagers, the 15 to 17 year olds that go to the emergency room each year because of marijuana. Yep. marijuana. It was only marijuana, nothing else in their system, right? And it wasn't that Y2K stuff that was out please there. Please look under Drug Abuse Warning Network. You can go, please look under the Drug Abuse Warning Network. And there's a tremendous amount of data. They, start, they, uh, they take it out as far as alcohol, alcohol with other drugs, and they put it as marijuana. Now, I picked the one with strictly 15 to 17-year-olds. 
It's 45,900 and something increasing. It's more predominant in the states where you have, quote, medical marijuana because the kids believe it's medicine and it won't hurt them. You will also find in there that this is growing at a certain percent. But please go on it. It's, you know, I'll be happy to give you the, the contact. It was marijuana, marijuana only, and it was uh, paranoia and the different mental problems that you face with a heavy concentration of this drug. Remember, this drug that we all have on the street now is around 13% confiscated, where it used to be around 2 to 4%. And some of the stuff in Colorado is 20 25%, and the dabbing is up to 80 85%. So when you have young kids getting that stuff, it puts them in yaw yaw yaw. And when the right. doctor prescribed that they take a nap? <laughs> what, what, what do you... What, but, no, but what's the... But what, what was the outcome? Right? They, they, I mean, I don't, I'm not advocating for kids to get high, but when a kid goes to the hospital with, with marijuana, doesn't it just wear off and then they are a normal kid again the next day? Well, you would normally think it would wear off, but one cannabis cigarette stays in the body 21 days. It's absorbed in the brain, it's absorbed in the testicles, and absorbed in the mammary glands. It doesn't go away overnight. That's the reason the problems with cannabis research is you build up tolerance to it over time. Right. And the kids, they, they also have the data striated as where it goes to psychiatric treatment, which goes to other emergency room, or to detoxes. All right, let's check out what we've ended up with in this final survey. Um, the first one was not in any form at 9%, uh, in a non-smokable form for medical use only, 11%, in any form for medical use only, 43% and for medical use and or recreational use, 36%. So those numbers, to tell you the truth, from the beginning to the, the end after the first survey have remained fairly strong um, in favor in this crowd, straw poll, non-scientific, uh, in favor of this medical marijuana ballot issue, which at this point, I haven't seen any of the latest polling, but the, the, the polling was fairly strong the last time I looked in favor of this. Am I not correct? Yeah, there's been about four polls in the last month, uh, one with 70, one with 74, one with 75, one with 78. All right. Um, do you have any explanation for why so many people would be in favor of this, Doc? No. That's a wonderful thing of America. Because marijuana is medicine. your opinion. <laughs> And the more it gets talked about, the more people are going to support it. So come out and vote yes on Amendment 2 this fall. You want to wrap up with me? Again, it's been, um, it's been quite an evening. I was telling the gentleman up here, um, I've done this a time or two. Um, and this, is, uh, this, has been a, this has been a difficult one. Um, and, and I'll tell you why. And I'll tell you why. And I told them this, too. Um, there is emotion involved in this issue that is not like anti-tax emotion. There's, there's, there's real people's lives involved and people looking for solutions. And I think every person on the dais tonight is compassionate and looking for that solution too. And we appreciate their time, um, their uh, patience, and uh, their, their thoughts and their information. So a round of applause for all three of our guests tonight. And now I have one last question. Um, and we'll do it the old-fashioned way. Um, by uh, raising your hands, how many of you like this village square format where we have the polling and the... Okay, all right. I'm going to call it unanimous because I can. Uh, um, <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for David for putting it together. Thanks for all your thoughts and your patience and your participation. Let's do it again.